Hi, everyone. Happy Wednesday. It's Lisa here, and I'm very excited to be with you today for our weekly global online fireside chat. Today, I'm broadcasting to you, to you live once again from a very early San Francisco, California. As the summer draws to a close, you can only but wait with eager anticipation to see what excitement the new seasons bring with them in Silicon Valley's startup world. As always, today we have an amazing session planned for you. We have a panel of brilliant VIP guests joining us from across the globe, logging in to help you understand the value of accelerators and incubators to the startup ecosystem. I know we have tons and tons to learn from our exceptional guests today. Now I've got you all excited, let me go ahead and introduce you to our VIP guests before asking them to properly introduce themselves to you. Welcome to California, USA-based Carter Wigel, who's a serial entrepreneur, cloud expert, and innovator. Welcome to Montreal, Canada-based Mark Barsha, who's an entrepreneur, technologist, and innovator. Welcome to New York, USA-based Adam Burke, who's an entrepreneur, innovator, problem solver, and change catalyst. Welcome to Calcutta, India-based Raghav Kanoria, who's an angel investor, community builder, public speaker, and fundraising expert. Welcome to Israel-based Tal Katran, who's an accelerator guru, public speaker, ecosystem builder, and mentor. Welcome to Mumbai, India-based Elsa Marie De Silva, who's an aviation industry expert, women's empowerment advocate, writer, and international public speaker. And welcome to California, USA-based David Saad, who's a serial entrepreneur, business builder, public speaker, and mentor. Now, I know you want to meet them, so here they are. Let me ask our VIP guests to properly introduce themselves to you. Welcome to Carter. Do you want to say hi to everyone? Hello, everybody. My name is Carter Weigel. Excited to be here. Uh, a little quickly about my background. I actually started at Salesforce when there was 100 people in the company. I was fortunate to go through the IPO and actually spent 10 years there. Uh, I left Salesforce and I co-founded a startup called Cloud Sugar. We were a cloud services firm, so learned a ton about uh, cloud computing, how to adopt uh, cloud technology. Salesforce Ventures invested in that company. And then we were uh, went through a double acquisition, uh, ultimately to Accenture for $400 million. Uh, and now I'm the CEO of a company called Ideator, and we built a global innovation network. Welcome, Carter, and I can tell you guys he's one of the coolest entrepreneurs I know in Silicon Valley, so we're very excited to have him join us. All the way from Montreal, Mark, please say hi to everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark. Um, I've been in the startup ecosystem here in Montreal, Canada, for almost 20 years now. Uh, my current startup, two years in, is called Unito. We connect um, work apps used by different teams and departments, so apps like Trello, Asana, Jira, GitHub, and a bunch more. Basically, let everybody collaborate from their app of choice. Um, and in terms of accelerators, um, I ran three ideas, one of which was Unito, through what you could call an early stage accelerator called Founder Institute. And then I had multiple opportunities to join top accelerators, but we decided not to go. So probably have a bit of a different perspective than many here. Anyways, happy to be here. We're very excited to have Mark join us. You're going to hear him share some fascinating insights today. So welcome, Mark. David, please say hi to everyone. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is David Saad. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I founded uh, six companies, four of, of which exited. And recently, I switched gear and became uh, uh, joined the uh, venture capital industry. I'm also an angel investor. And I'm also a mentor at one of the uh, most prominent uh, accelerator for uh, B2B kind of businesses, which is Alchemist. And I've used accelerators and incubators uh, myself as an entrepreneur, as an investor, and as well as a mentor. So I know uh, that ecosystem quite well. As you can see, you're going to learn from the best today, everyone. And now let's ask Elsa Marie to say hi from India. Elsa Marie, please say hi from India. Hi, everyone. This is Elsa Marie De Silva from Mumbai, India. I'm the founder and CEO of Red Dot Foundation. Our flagship platform is Safe City, which is a crowd map for sexual violence. I started it after a 20-year career in aviation in response to a horrific gang rape in India. And since then, I've uh, depended on incubators and accelerators and mentors uh, all around the world to help me uh, you know, scale Safe City, not only on the technology side, but on all the, in all the other areas as well. And I'm looking forward to sharing my experiences with you today. Welcome, Elsa Marie. Very excited to have you finally join us. Tal, all the way from Israel. Please say hi to everyone. Hey, hi, everyone. Shalom from the startup nation of the world. Glad to be here on board. 
by myself, in short, I've established, first of all, I'm a serial of everything when it comes to the ecosystem, but uh, specifically, I'm a serial uh, accelerator builder, established nine of them here in Israel, different business models, I hope we can talk about them later, some of them for municipalities, academies, and some for corporates. I've done the same worldwide uh, in several countries. My latest is actually in India, in uh, Delhi. Excited to be on board and share with you my experience. Welcome, Tal. And Raghav, please say hi to everyone. Hi, everyone. This is Raghav Panoria from India. Um, I've had some experience in the fund industry for a while now. I worked in three funds, which has raised capital from United States, Australia, and UK. I started uh, East India's uh, largest angel network called Calcutta Angels, where we invested in 20 startups. And recently, I started East India's first private accelerator called Neoleap, which uh, we are running into a second batch now, and we are looking to collaborate globally. Welcome, Raghav. Very, very excited to have our VIPs joining us today. Now, I know you want to learn from them, so I'm going to just jump into some shout outs and go as quickly as I humanly can. On the screen are contact details for our panelists. Feel free to reach out to them. I know they love hearing from you. Don't forget to keep sending your questions through to inspireme at onlinefiresidechat.com and we'll do our best to, to have them all answered today. And our VIPs love you learning, so just keep in contact with them. Given how many of you are joining us today, we have community champions from around the world managing the chat room. If you have a question for one, for one of our VIPs, our, our, our champions will do them, their best to get them answered. Just a reminder, we have community champions, ever-growing meetup groups, in what is now 60 countries and 80 cities around the globe, including North and South America, the UK, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, India, Asia, and Australia. If you'd like to meet up with your local chapters, you'd like to start your own, feel free to reach out to us via email and we'll do our best to put you in contact with them. On that note, I know I say this twice a week, but I can't say it enough. Thank you to all our volunteer champions from around the globe. You are the heart and soul of our community and we would not be here today without you. Over the next few months, our aim is to inspire and empower entrepreneurs in more than 100 countries, and we know together we can make that happen. Thanks to our VIP guests for joining us today and sharing your knowledge and wisdom so freely. We are very appreciative to have you join us. Thank you to our growing family of supporters and collaborators from around the developing world who are once again hosting sessions for hundreds of entrepreneurs who don't have access to necessary bandwidth or understanding the English language to join their sessions, our sessions on their own. Thank you to all the presidents, prime ministers, government ministries, UN offices, World Economic Forum, US Embassy Corners, British Council offices, university campuses, schools, business incubators, chamber of commerce, community centers and radio stations for all your weekly hosting support and for raising awareness within your regions and communities. Thank you to everyone from the UN Women team as well for all your support. We once again stream across new live platforms today and we're very excited to share some very exciting news with you on that front. If you'd like us to stream from a radio station in your community, make sure to reach out to us and we'll do our best to come to your part of the world. Now you're all here to learn and that's exactly what we're going to do. Our session for today is accelerators and incubators. Do they really make a difference to the success of your startup? As everybody knows, we want the good, bad and ugly just to make our VIP guests who are going to pose a question to one of you, but it goes to all of you. Please feel free to share your answers and don't feel shy. The more we can learn, the better for all of us. So jumping right in, we're going to throw Mark in the deep end. So Mark, get ready. I know this is a question you're very passionate about, but you're going to open it up today. So Mark, what are incubators and what are accelerators? Let's do this. Actually, if there was a really simple I wish there was a simple answer to that, um, especially in the last years as there's been more and more of those. Uh, typically, accelerators now are focus on a little bit of a later stage of the company that are already on the market that have launched or on the verge of launching, and their focus is to accelerate the growth within the market in a short amount of time, typically to lead to an investment from venture capital. Um, incubators on the other end, the earlier stage of the spectrum and uh, are typically more at the idea stage uh, and incubating that idea to turn it into potentially a business. Uh, that's the high level, but you can find everything in the middle. Thank you, Mark. And I know David's got some insights he'd love to add to, to what you've been sharing. Thanks, Mark, for opening us up today. David, go for it. Uh, yes, in addition to what Mark said, uh, the way we look at incubators and accelerators, we tie them up to, to stages of the company. So we look at idea stage uh, uh, or, or idea validation, product validation, 
customer validation and eventually market validation. So incubators don't have a specific time frame. So they incubate ideas and the result or the output of all of that is that you have your idea validated. And typically incubators could be established by uh, institutions or, or actually commercial like IDLF. Accelerators, on the other hand, are for a very specific uh, period of time, typically for three to six months. And they cover really top, very specific topics to really accelerate uh, uh, and, and get you to product validation, which leads eventually to an investment. And, and those are the main differences between incubators and accelerators. And in addition to that, incubators typically do have facilities while accelerators may or may not. Thank you, David. And following up from what you um, were saying and Mark was saying, Carter, um, you've seen a lot of the good, bad and ugly when it comes to accelerators and incubators. In your opinion, what challenges do they ultimately create? Sure. I think that, um, you know, really what I've seen in, in the market over the years um, is I've actually looked at it a little bit through a different lens and how can these accelerators and incubators successfully scale. Um, you know, one of the big challenges out there is that typically less than 2% of people who are applying to an accelerator incubator get accepted. So um, looking at how these accelerators and incubators can scale um, and what is the cost risk and complexity around doing that. So uh, my company, IDATOR, we've actually taken a, a lens and looked at that and are trying to help these different programs scale by using technology and giving entrepreneurs access to tools and resources faster. Thank you, Carter. On that note, Tal, I know you build accelerators around the globe and you do it for big corporates, governments. Um, in your opinion, based on what you know, why and when should a company ultimately join an accelerator? I think, first of all, when we talk about startup, we talk generally about uh, early stage ones. It doesn't matter if they have just an idea, a PowerPoint presentation startup, or uh, if they have really an MVP, a minimum viable product. They're still not so much a company, but for sure they lack a lot of experience and knowledge. So in our case, uh, accelerators here in Israel, the average would be five months program. It will not be dealing with technology. Um, I myself am trying to change this. I think accelerators worldwide should start do, dealing also with technology, not just talking about it, but actually doing it. And putting aside maybe dealing less with the demo day stuff and logos and how do you do your presentation. Incubators in our case are chief scientist one, which means belongs to the government. They give a, uh, about half a million dollars and they last about two years. So in my, in my opinion, any new startup, for sure in a pre-seed stage, should get himself into the right accelerator because there he will get this toolbox of experience and knowledge and he will be handhold. He needs this, he needs the ecosystem to be around him and the accelerator actually gives him, provides him this access to the ecosystem. Thank you, Tal. Some absolutely fascinating insights being shared today. Raghav, I know you've got some thoughts you'd like to share here. Please go for it. Yeah, I would like to add something on the incubator and accelerator. Basically, we look at the accelerator in India with a value addition. Basically, we are saying that we'll give you business connects, we'll give you uh, customer connects, and we'll validate your business, which is what maybe an incubator does not do. So we really believe that an accelerator is one step ahead of an incubator. An incubator is more when you get a business plan, you want to refine it, you want to get a facility to sit with, and you know you want to work with that maybe in teams. And the accelerator takes you to the next level. Thank you, Raghav. I know Elsa Marie's also got some thoughts you'd like to share here. Please go for it, Elsa Marie. Hi. So as I explained earlier, you know, I uh, started Safe City after being in the corporate sector. So for me, it was absolutely essential to be part of an incubator to find out who, you know, how to scale my work. So first of all, it was what kind of an organization that I would need to uh, set up? Would it be a for-profit or a not-for-profit? That's like a fundamental existential question. And then who are your customers? Because in my case, my customers and my users are not the same. And then Everyone, I'm so sorry. Elsa Marie seems to be having some technical challenges there. 
Um, David, would you like to share your insights and then we'll come back to Elsa Marie? Uh, yes. uh, one additional point that I would like to add, the difference between incubators and accelerators is the, uh, is the um, whether or not they take an equity position. Incubators typically, especially the ones that are established by institutions, do not take an equity position in startups, even though the commercial ones do, like Idea Lab does. Uh, on the other hand, the typical accelerator uh, do take an equity position. So they provide a certain minimum amount of funding that could range anywhere from 10,000 to about 150,000 in exchange of anywhere between 3% to about maybe 7 or 8% equity position that converts into preferred or uh, eventually common stock in, 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 in the startup. Thank you, David. I know Elsa Marie's back. Elsa Marie, did you want to finish? Did you have any other thoughts you'd like to share in terms of what David was saying? Yeah, so I think it's absolutely critical for uh, an entrepreneur to be part of uh, an incubator at a very early stage to help define uh, their existence and how they would uh, make their organization sustainable. And then at some point later, be part of an accelerator to take stock as to what has worked and what hasn't, so that you can then uh, plan uh, for your next phase of scale up or even growth. Thank you, Elsa Marie. I'm terribly sorry, everyone. We seem to be having some technical difficulties from one of our panelists, but we're doing our best to deal with that. So our next question is directed at all, but of course it goes to our whole panel, and it talks about accelerator models. And I know there are quite a few different types of accelerator models. Some are paid for, some um, take equity in the startups, others invest money in the startups. And we would like to know from our experts what the best option is because I think we've all made these mistakes and yeah tell why don't you hit it tell us what you think so first of all the question goes if I understand it correctly it would be for the um, entity or people that actually establish this uh, accelerator is not the one taking part in because the one taking part in actually well again saying that from Israel we have only about 200 and something uh, accelerators running here now, the accelerators here in Israel, they differ because some of them would be for uh, academy. So the academy actually takes from the, uh, maybe from the tuition some money, but there is no equity, of course, and no royalties. In Israel, generally, 90-something percent of the programs do not take any equity because they don't invest money. So you would give equity just, uh, just when you get funded, of course. Now, funding... Uh, would be for programs that would be under the corporates. So here what we see in the last three years is a, is a shift from those open, uh, open programs where everyone can get a board to the specific, to the more clustered one. So that would be probably under corporates like Coca-Cola, like IBM, Facebook, Google, I don't know, name it. Uh, they have a program in, here in Israel and they know specifically what they look for in regards to technology. And for them, it will be a great opportunity, first of all, to, to, to meet great people, possibly great workers in, in the future, but also, of course, great technology that they can embed to them for the insight. So, you know, it never ends in the program. I mean, what, what I wanted to say before is that for the entrepreneurs getting on board those programs, you have this mistake in your mind that you all practice for the demo day and for sure you're gonna raise money. Well, that's a news flash. No one raises money on a demo day. Everyone raises money much later. It's about your technology and your team, and this you know. So here in Israel, again, when you go to the, to the business models of the programs, if it's not academy, it's corporate. Corporate is very clear. Corporate will probably invest either in services or in, in hard cash, and then we take uh, some of the equity. New ones are the municipality ones, where municipalities themselves, they go mainly for smart city, which is now everything, everyone wants smart city, IOT, security, transport, whatever. And again, it will be about funding. And I think very different for many countries that our government specifically is very involved in, and the government actually established about 18 incubators where they get again Thank you, uh, Tal. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. We've just got some questions we want to throw at you and your co-panelists, so we're just going to move on to our next one. Mark, I know you had some fascinating insights to share on this topic. Please go ahead, jump right in. Well, I think I'd like to kind of riff on what Tal said about 
the perception that things like Demo Day are going to bring you money and, and that'll be the, it'll change your entire business. Um, and I think there's, there's also from by bringing it back to the perspective of the entrepreneur, there are so many options and types of accelerators it is extremely confusing. Um, so I think what's, what's the approach I recommend is to take a step back and look at the accelerators around you individually and think about what you're trying to get out of it. Um, and it generally comes down to what we talked about, which is access to the ecosystem. Do you need that? Access to potentially investors at the demo day. Do you really think that's going to happen or not? And then in the other context is giving you um, an environment that puts a lot of pressure, a timeline focus on your startup, which is often what um, less experienced entrepreneurs will need, the right context to, to execute. So, uh, I'm not, there's too many options, so you have to look what's around you and take them one step at a time, evaluate them one at a time and research them. That's generally like, it has to be much more practical than trying to understand the entire accelerator ecosystem because there's too many. Thank you, Mark. And while you're on the subject, do you want to just touch on for many of our entrepreneurs around the world, they're not fully um, comfortable with the term demo day. I know it's an American concept that's gone global, but we'd love for you to quickly just touch on what exactly it is. Sure. So demo day is typically the, is the culmination of the typical accelerator. It is an event at the end of the period of the accelerator where the, there are a bunch of investors from, from the local ecosystem that are invited typically sat in a room and then all of the, uh, the, uh, the entrepreneurs and the startups from the program are pranced around in front of the investors. They pitch for three minutes. It's a competition pitch. They all try to sound better than the other. And then the investors get the opportunity either there live or later on to invest in the company. Um, and it's, it's very classic and um, it, there's, there's been a lot of frustration related to that because the perception for the entrepreneur is that a demo day you're going to raise and it's going to change your business. I think Tal was pretty clear about that. It is a very small percentage of businesses uh, raise money out of the accelerators at a demo day, basically. Thank you, Mark. Some fascinating, fascinating insights being shared here today. David, the next question goes to you, and we'd love to hear your co-panelists' thoughts on this too. We've talked about giving up equity in return for capital. Um, you've seen and done a lot. You've experienced a lot through the, the ecosystem and that. Let's talk about what, what is reasonable when you're giving up equity in return for some cash to be invested into your business. Please share, David. Uh, yes, so the range... Uh, is between uh, 3% on the low end, as high as 7 sometimes even 8%. Uh, now, what, uh, what defines that percentage is, the, uh, is not so much the quality of the program from a curriculum viewpoint, even though that that's very important, but it's rather the value of the network of investors that can step in and help you. So, uh, for example, Y Combinator, which is considered rightfully or wrongfully, whichever you want to look at it, as being the Ivy League of accelerators, uh, which spin, spin off of uh, Google. They have the what we call here in Silicon Valley, the Google Mafia. So their network is extremely valuable. Uh, and on demo day, you've got some top notch uh, uh, angel investors or even venture capital firm that are going to listen to you. And probably uh, they probably invest in some of the top uh, uh, startups. Uh, on the lower end is when you have an accelerator who is not very well known, whose, whose network is not as uh, extended, extensive as, as uh, so somebody like uh, Y Combinator or 500 Startup or Alchemist. So that really defines what the accelerator is going to demand in terms of uh, their equity position. Thank you, David. Raghav, I know you've got some insights you wanted to share there. Please go for it. Yeah, so in India, what we've seen recently is that there are some corporate accelerators which are coming up. So, for, for example, a corporate accelerator which is uh, running in healthcare, education, uh, real estate, and hospitality, these four sectors, and they have in-house mentors who've got operational experience to guide the startups. Those accelerators are taking even up to 10% equity without investing cash. 
Uh, they're investing cash, they might even go up to 15% because they're saying we are also going to be your first customer in these four verticals. So if you have that kind of value addition to give the startup, you can take a much higher equity position. But if you're providing vanilla services, uh, we feel here in India, you should not take more than 5% equity. Sometimes it is 3%. And if you're investing in cash, you can go up to maybe uh, 7 to 10% equity along with the services that you provide. Thank you, Agav. Uh, I know Elsa Marie's got some interesting thoughts to share here in terms of nonprofits joining accelerators, incubators. Elsa Marie, please go for it. And then I know David's got some thoughts he'd like to share too. Go for it, Elsa Marie. So some of the most pressing problems in the world require you to be set up as a not-for-profit organization. And therefore, you know, I think a lot of the startup world is geared towards uh, the for-profit uh, organizations. In fact, in my very first incubate, incubator, they were forcing us to think of being a for-profit, but ultimately we went down the not-for-profit route. And in a country like India, uh, you don't have um, an option uh, like the you know social entrepreneurship model in the US. It's still very nascent in India. So we are set up as a Section 8 company, but it's a not-for-profit. And so there's no equity, but there is a great need for uh, you know this kind of an ecosystem that will help an entrepreneur think about um, everything from scale up and sustainability to uh, accessing resources for your organization and i believe that um, you know there are angel investors like dusan stojanovic who uh, invested in us but it was not for equity and it was not for a share of our business but really for genuinely helping us to take the cause forward Thank you, Elsa Marie. Once again, fascinating insights being shared. Uh, I know David's got some thoughts he'd like to share here. David, please go for it. Uh, yes, uh, it's important to understand that, technically speaking, when an accelerator invests, they're really not investing in equity. Uh, and the rationale behind that is that uh, the instrument, the financial instrument being used, is not geared towards a, a, a priced round. Uh, but rather it's a convertible note. Uh, so typically, for example, Y Combinator uses uh, um, a safe document, uh, while, for example, 500 Startup uses the, a, what, what they call a KISS document, all of which are really a convertible. Uh, a convertible note carries an interest rate with a maturity date. So the idea here is to postpone the valuation of the company because you are at a, such an early stage you, you don't want to prematurely set up your valuation. So you're postponing your valuation to the Series A. And that's why they use either a KISS or a SAFE or a convertible note. Thank you, David. Um, I know that uh, Mark's also got some insights in terms of what you were just saying that he'd like to just share with our global community. Mark, please go for it. Sure. I think I think the fundamental question is, should I join an accelerator and, and which one should I aim for? And, and those questions are, you know, there's no simple answer to it, but a frame, you have to have some kind of framework to tackle this because there's just so many options from your local ecosystem to even applying remotely to a Y Combinator or 500 or a Techstars, which are kind of the more well-known brands. Uh, but take the time to think about what's available uh, and analyze them one by one. It's, it's hard work, but that is the only way to do the right choice. If you if you're a new entrepreneur, I think there is a lot of there's always a lot of value in accelerators, but uh, if you're a new entrepreneur, it is generally recommended. It'll it'll help you become an entrepreneur that is more savvy more quickly, for sure. Uh, but do the do your diligence and research the individual accelerators. That's my main recommendation for anybody considering accelerators. Thank you, Mark. And on that note, uh, Carter, you're a serial entrepreneur. Um, you've just come out of one of the top accelerators here in Silicon Valley. Um, we'd love to hear from you. How much value did you get out of being an accelerator and any advice you can share in terms of entrepreneurs joining them? Sure. Yeah, I think all the prior advice is really spot on. I, I think it's really important to you know, number one, consider what do you think is going to be the most strategic outcome of the accelerator incubator and really research the model to understand that. So 
are you going in for investment? Are you going in for first customers? Are you trying to build the network? Um, so we actually went through the Salesforce incubator. Uh, it was a, a non-equity program, but um, for us, the, the major value was actually getting very close to the Salesforce product team. Uh, they helped us build our architecture on some of the Salesforce technology. Um, they also actually helped us get first customers uh, and some strategic customers actually coming out of the incubator. We landed one of the largest private equity companies in the world uh, as a, a first customer, and it was really because Salesforce was putting their brand behind us uh, and helping to accelerate us uh, forward, uh, really helping us to be enterprise ready around security and a lot of areas that um, my team initially didn't have a lot of expertise around. Thank you, Carter. So did you meet your main goals in terms of joining the Accelerator? Would you recommend the experience overall? Uh, I absolutely would. I, I think, you know, I talked to a lot of people out in the market, and I think that's another important thing to do um, at the accelerators and incubators, but also really importantly, interview the people who have actually been in the programs themselves. They're, they're the best people they're going to tell you about the outcomes, their experience. Uh, hands down, the number one thing that I always hear is the network. So the network is your first customers, it's your investors and it's also the unknown of being part of new networks so um, we absolutely were able to achieve uh, our strategic uh, goals and uh, and very thankful for the opportunity some great insights being shared we'll definitely come to the topic of alumni networks and how much we can actually get out of them as entrepreneurs tal i know you've got some thoughts you want to share them elsa marie david and mark definitely go for it tal let's hear your thoughts yeah, so uh, I wanted to say this, and this is after, you know, like uh, being in half of the world, just because I can't be in the second half, sadly cannot be in the second half of the world. But anyways, entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs everywhere. The life of the very difficult entrepreneurs usually are poor for money, but they've got great motivation, and that's what works for them. Everything is individual. Whatever you hear, it's all, always right, but everything in the end is about you. The upside is yours. The hard work should come from you as well. It's not like when you think about a program like an accelerator incubator that you're coming in and someone is going to rip you up and take you places and show you things. No, it's about you doing the job. You need to be the one pulling the sleeve, saying I need some attention and some help. You need to work hard. You work the hardest when you're inside the program where in, in your thoughts, it's very different. Listen, the success is all about you. Our business entrepreneurship is all about people. Investors are people, your, your CTOs are people and yourselves. So get that figured out, I fully agree. You need to screen and see what is the right program for you, but it's very hard work. As said by a true Israeli entrepreneur, very, very good insights, thank you. Tell Elsa Marie, I know you wanted to add some stuff there, please go for it. In addition to all the great advice given, I would like to echo that uh, as an entrepreneur, you should be clear about your vision and do your homework and due diligence about these incubators and accelerators. Know what you want to get out of them and leverage the opportunity to the utmost. Always remember it's a two-way street. You're not, uh, you know, the only one benefiting. They are benefiting from having you being part of their uh, program as well. So keep that in mind. Uh, have your own convictions. Uh, you know, mentors can advise you, but ultimately the hard work is yours. The uh, motivation and the passion is yours. So you need to uh, extract the most that you want out of it. And, uh, you know, build your networks and ecosystem based on that. Thank you, Elsa Marie. David, I know you also had some insights you wanted to share here. I know Mark did as well, and Raghav also wanted to talk about some network ideas there. David, please go for it. Yes, if I were to summarize, uh, incubators and accelerators had <clears throat> uh, four elements, if you, if you wish. They've got a space, they've got a curriculum, a program, uh, they've got a network of investors, and they've got a network of mentors. So depending on your stage and depending on what kind of entrepreneur you are, uh, those elements will take higher or lower priority. For example, if you are a first time entrepreneur out of school and you have an idea, then in this case, the curriculum or the program of an accelerator, uh, you know, takes the highest priority because you really need to acquire uh, the knowledge to become a good entrepreneur. 
Uh, on the other hand, if you are a very experienced entrepreneur and you have an MVP already and you're looking for uh, some uh, seed funding, then the network of investor uh, become, uh, it becomes a higher priority. So that really gives you uh, a good uh, framework to decide on which accelerator and why do you want to join and who should join. Thank you, David. Mark, I know you had some insights to share there. Ragava also know you had some insights to share there. Mark, please go for it. I'm just going to add uh, to what other people have said. Elsa mentioned, and David, know what you want. Carter mentioned, talk to other grads. And a couple more. I don't hesitate to ask the hard questions to the accelerators. Like, ask them how many people raised upon the last demo day or graduation overall, last cohort. What does a week look like during the accelerator? How hands-on the program? Uh, what's their focus on? And then a second and last tip, don't forget to research the program directors. Um, I found that the individuals in the program make a very big difference in the quality, uh, how dedicated they are. Do they truly enjoy helping entrepreneurs? Are they full time on the accelerator or not? So uh, know what you want, talk to grads, ask the hard questions and research the directors. On that note, Mark, I'm coming back to you with a follow-up question right now. So everybody, stick around. Raghav, I know you had some insights to share on an earlier question regarding alumni networks and the power that they help they add to ultimately your success as a startup founder. Raghav, please go for it. So what we've done in our accelerator, and uh, this is a practical example, is that the startups that apply to the accelerator, we always have a deal champion who is from that industry, who then becomes the mentor for that startup. And that mentor then takes the startup through its challenges and various facets before they pitches on demo day. And then that deal champion, who is also the mentor, then helps the startup to even pitch on demo day. So what happens is that you have a wide variety of people from various industries. They actually help the startup to go and actually raise capital for the startup over a period of time. So it's very important to have domain experts who are also investors uh, in the accelerator or either you are plugged to them through outside networks. Thank you, Raghav. And on that note, we're gonna be talking about some of the red flags that we should all look out for in terms of uh, joining accelerators and the due diligence that we do before joining them. I can honestly speak and say that I've joined an accelerator here in the US coming from South Africa, and it wasn't quite what I had in mind. And it was a very scary experience moving to a new country and being told you're going to get all this help and in actual fact, not getting that help. So I know that we've got some interesting insights to share there. David, would you like to talk about the due diligence we should be doing before joining an accelerator? I think what Mark uh, was saying is the uh, spot on the money. I mean, uh, to me, from my perspective, uh, it's really about the mentors, and I, and I distinguish between mentors and lecturers. Uh, a, a, a teacher is someone who's going to teach you knowledge, but may or may not have experience. And what you really need, especially in an accelerator, because the idea is to accelerate, uh, uh, someone who has been there, done that, and has practical experience, has contacts, et cetera, et cetera, that helps you really accelerate for you to validate either your idea or your product. Uh, so uh, for me, the due diligence is really about uh, not so much the infrastructure or maybe even the program itself, but, but really the focus is, should be on who's going to mentor you. And the gentleman from India is right on the money. It's, a, it's really the, at this stage, fundraising uh, has an inherent hurting mentality. So if you can have a champion championing your cause and can herd some angel investors for you on demo day, and therefore the demo day becomes a conclusion rather than a starting point, uh, that would be extremely helpful. Now, can you do that with the accelerator operators help you do that? Uh, that should be one of your criteria, whether or not to join or not to join a certain accelerator. Thank you, David. And I know one of the things that comes up on a daily basis, I get thousands of entrepreneurs reaching out to me in terms of connecting them with mentors. And Tal, I'd love for you to touch on this as part of your answer. How do our entrepreneurs differentiate between mentors that can truly add value versus 
they sound really cool and yeah, it's great to hang out with them, but they can't ultimately help our businesses succeed. Tell, please share your thoughts. Yeah, so first of all about red flags, I would say uh, when this broadcast ends, listen to it well again and recommend to your friends. This is A. Number two, I would say 70% of the success when you join the program is on yourself. I mean, take, take yourself in your own hands. This is uh, something you should uh, look, about, uh, look upon yourself and see if you're ready to take on board the obligation of being in the program. And afterwards, for sure, it will be all the other uh, uh, comments that you heard until now. Uh, but yes, it would be reading. It will be, you know, learning how the program runs, who is inside. Probably you will not know who will be sharing, who will be also on the program, but you would know who are the mentors, okay? And this is to go to the second question about the mentors. So selecting a mentor, I mean, this is your best friend for, for a, a period of time. I mean, this is a lot about chemistry, of course. And remember this, a mentor, like your advisory board, is good for a certain period of time. So it's like a child, it grows, it needs different things and different stages. Same as you, same as your mentors. You should find the right mentor to the right stage you are now. A mentor cannot help with everything. It needs to be very specific, very uh, to the point. So go meet them. I know many of us do what is called speed dating with mentors. Find the right mentors and understand it is for a period of time and then it's okay to switch on. Same as it to replace your advisory board with the next bunch of people that you will need for your next stage. Brilliant, brilliant insights. I know a lot of entrepreneurs reach out to me and they say, I've outgrown my mentor or he can't help me anymore. Is that okay? So thank you for touching on that, Tal. Very valuable insights. Mark, I know you had some thoughts to share. Then Elsa Marie and Ragav also wants to share. Mark, please go for it. Sure. Um, I just want to make one thing very clear is that the value of accelerators, uh, you know, learning, mentors, investors, what we talked about, you can actually get it without an accelerator. Um, it's probably more work, especially if you're new at entrepreneurship, but it is uh, it is possible to do it, including mentors. Uh, you can meet the mentors in your ecosystem without the accelerator, but the accelerator gives you more easy access and it gives you a good hook in the sense that it's much easier to engage them, including investors, if you're in the context of an accelerator. But just realize it is all doable without the accelerator. And when you, you have to evaluate what how valuable is that easier access to you versus hustling and doing it directly? Thank you, Mark. Elsa Marie, your thoughts? In my experience, if you expect to raise money by attending an incubator and an accelerator, you might be sorely disappointed. And those, uh, you know, um, programs are not just for raising money, but it's really to help you think about your business and uh, you know, make it sustainable. I also feel that it takes time and maybe these relationships, even with the mentors and investors that you meet in these programs, it takes time to translate into, uh, you know, a money related deal. And that could be months down the line. And often I find that uh, you need to prove yourself as a person and with your product and build trust. So when, when people are confident about you and what you bring to the table and the value that you add, they may be more willing to take that risk and invest in you. So keep that in mind. If you get lucky right then and then on demo day, that's great. But uh, don't feel disheartened either because these are relationships for the long term. Build on them. Thank you, Elsa Marie. Raghav, I know you had some insights to share. David also had some insights to share. And the next question is for Carter. Please go for it, Raghav. Yes, a couple of points on uh, the red flags for an accelerator. And, you know, uh, one is, of course, the mentors, the quality of the mentors that should be on the website. You should look up uh, the mentors who are there, the advisory board, who are the people who are advising the program directors, who are the program directors themselves. And given the past track record of the accelerator, you should check with a couple of startups who have been there. Do they really have the business networks that they claim to have? right a lot of people claim a lot of things you should verify that uh, secondly do they have government connects because a lot of businesses are related to government we got a startup saying we want uh, to get connected to the mayor of the city because of parking automation so you know government and business connects both are important and on the question as to why you should go to an accelerator and not an individual because the accelerator aggregates 
all of these things together. And today is the world of aggregation. Thank you, Raghav. David, I know you had some quick insights to share there before we move on to our next question. Please go for it, David. Uh, yes, I think, uh, I think it was Mark who said that um, you can certainly get all the uh, content of a program even online without paying for it, without having to go through an accelerator. Uh, you can hook up with mentors on LinkedIn, for example, if you wish. So for those who are very resourceful and very astute uh, and very connected, uh, they may not need an accelerator. However, let me give you some inside information from a venture capitalist. Uh, I know from our fund, we do assign certain points for certain brands. For example, I sat on a pitch at San Hill Angels, for example, and um, you know, typically uh, they would assign a couple of points more for a company who graduated from YC uh, rather than from any other accelerator. In addition to that, if the mentor is somebody that whom we know, uh, then that adds even more credibility to the to the startup. So it's all about really the connection and who is helping you, where where are you graduating? And I think it is really smart for an entrepreneur to assign to assign a certain value of the brand of the accelerator even though that that may be a little bit costly in terms of the equity that is giving up. Uh, but, but that is very valuable for launching the product and, and securing some funding. David, you are extremely good at what you do because you touched on the question I was about to ask Carter. Carter, you play the role of entrepreneur, angel investor. You've been looking at setting up a VC fund. Do you perceive companies differently if they've been through an accelerator versus if they haven't? I know Mark also touched on this. Carter, please share your insights. You know, I think it's it's challenging. A lot of the startups that do come out of an accelerator incubator can look very polished. Um, they've gotten a lot of coaching. And so I think you just have to really drill down and, and look at the traditional things that you would around a startup, um, you know, their product market fit, their success that they've had, the team. Those are the core things. So. Um, I do think that a lot of the, again, the, the challenges, um, some of these companies come down, the accelerators or incubators might actually look a little bit better than they are. It's a very interesting thing you said that because I, I, having just gone through a few of the demo days, you actually see how strong the entrepreneurs come across. Often I think investors or new investors don't look more deeply into the businesses because the entrepreneurs are so polished. So Tal, I know you've got some insights you wanted to share there. Please go ahead. Yeah, so I think first of all, as being said here, it is very uh, uh, clear if, uh, if a startup has taken a part in a program or not. Uh, with us in Israel, you can take two or three programs at the same time, it's fine. Nowadays, if you've just gone through one program, it's like, uh, how about trying the next one? So really, it gets you a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, qualities, I think, and, and a great uh, toolbox of experience. And again, the recommendation is for sure, go and, and find yourself the right program and join it. Thank you, Tal. Now we're going to go run through our panel. It's our entrepreneur's favorite part of the session. We're going to ask our panelists, and each panelist has to answer, what excites you in 2017 and what industries are ripe for disruption? We're going to fly through our panel, starting with Carter. Carter. What industries are ripe for disruption and what excites you in 2017? Uh, what's uh, most exciting to me right now is, is healthcare. I think it's still the biggest opportunity for disruption and I think it has such an impact on all of us uh, daily. So uh, just seeing a lot of innovation happening right now uh, with youth um, at the university, governments. Uh, and so it's exciting to see the impact uh, that's happening rapidly globally uh, for all of us. Awesome. Mark, what excites you in 2017? What industries are ripe for disruption? Yeah, I'm going to skip the industry part, but just general worldwide entrepreneurship, the fact that the it's the entrepreneurship and innovation level is accelerating worldwide, and, and I think that has the biggest potential for disruption across all industries. I love it. Very great insights there. Raghav, what excites you and what industries are ripe for disruption? We are looking at fintech very actively. We think uh, India is a vast country with a population of 1.4 billion. Uh, there's a vast unbanked population, so a lot of technology can come in there, peer-to-peer -peer payments, digital wallets, online lending, et cetera. It's a vast universe, so we think fintech is the next opportunity here. 
Thank you, Tal. What excites you? What industries are right for disruption? Um, I would go with uh, transportation, and that would be specifically for uh, for IoT, and alongside it would be, of course, uh, cyber. So everything is like in a way uh, connected. So yeah, I, I would say transportation would be air, yeah, would be drones, but would be, of course, cars, and you know, uh, traffic is an issue everywhere in the world. Thank you, Tal Elsa Marie. Any uh, what what excites you in twenty seventeen? What industries are ripe for disruption? So for me, I'm very clear. My mission is, uh, you know, to eradicate all forms of violence against women. So I'm focused on putting gender on the agenda, especially on the smart cities, because I find that not many people are thinking about it actively. Thank you. And David, what excites you in 2017? What industries are ripe for disruption? So for us, it's not uh, specifically industry. Uh, and the reason is because we believe that there is a new technology that is coming up that is going to be disruptive across industries. So we are very interested in um, AI, machine learning, heuristics, platforms that will uh, change the, uh, the application development space. Uh, and that is across all industries. So, Anybody who's doing really deep R&D into artificial intelligence, natural language processing, um, uh, heuristics, machine learning, deep machine learning uh, is something that we are very excited about and we are ready to invest e e uh, uh, even at a very, very early stage. Thank you, David. Now, while we ask our VIPs to each prepare their tweet piece of advice that we can all go ahead and apply to our businesses, thanks to everyone for our truly amazing session today. As you can see, we got to learn from the world's best. Just to keep you posted on some of our upcoming sessions, once again, with the world's best joining us as panelists, this Sunday we have a very interesting one. ICOs, why are people investing in this phenomenon? An investor session definitely not worth missing. On uh, next Wednesday on September 6th, we've got Is Talent Overrated? Can being mentally tough really help you overcome anything as an entrepreneur? On the 10th of September, hiring for a perfect culture fit. What do you really need to know? And then a very fascinating one on the 13th of September, sleep in and make millions entrepreneurial ventures that allow you to work smart not hard that one's in honor of our friend tim ferris so we've got some very cool stuff coming up now we're going to ask our tweet piece of advice to all of our panelists and then we're just going to say bye to you guys so let's start with mark mark your tweet piece of advice do your research do your diligence just do the hard work to learn about the accelerator great thoughts ragav your tweet piece of advice go to the accelerator that takes you to market that makes you raise capital and get real mentors. Awesome. Tell your tweet piece of advice. I would say, first of all, remember it's all in your hands. And second, do uh, respect everyone who, you know, reaches out to you and help you. I hope everybody's taking notes of these, tweet, uh, of these tweets. Elsa Marie, your tweet piece of advice. As an entrepreneur, remember incubators and accelerators are here to help you. So be clear in your mission and vision. Great insights. David, your tweet piece of advice. Uh, don't be a uh, dollar foolish and uh, or uh, whatever that saying is. Uh, so <laughs> don't be cheap. Um, and if you have to give some equity for some people who are, who are really going to help you, uh, go for the top accelerators. It's really worth it. Fantastic insights. And last but definitely not least, Carter, your tweet piece of advice. I have a tight plan coming into the accelerator incubator with clear outcomes that you want to achieve. And that's what makes them the world's best at what they do. From our side, please keep us up to date on your little progress. We love hearing from you. You can always drop us an email to inspire me at onlinefiresidechat.com. You can find me as well as our VIP guests and champions on LinkedIn. Don't forget, if you enjoyed today's session, make sure to share the invite with entrepreneurs in your community. We want to get to 100 countries and know with your help we can make it happen. My tweet, piece of advice, be grateful for everything you have. We are extraordinarily lucky to be entrepreneurs and to learn from such amazing people, such as the ones joining us today never ever ever forget it is a privilege being an entrepreneur thanks again to everyone for an absolutely amazing week as these vips would tell you to keep hustling and never ever ever give up guys on the count of three please shout bye so here we go one two three bye guys bye, bye. 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 thanks guys oh.